Thank you, and um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, kind invitation. It's a, a great honor for me to be here with you in uh, Norway this morning. Um, I, I was thinking with the Twitter account yesterday, Phil, when you were doing your presentation about the dangers of technology, I was posting comments about it on Twitter. <laughs> It's, uh, it's very strange being a human being <laughs> sometimes. I, I was reminded of Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. He was a, a, a good Protestant, and he, um, he wanted to become a better person. So he put together a checklist for himself each week, and actually he would check it each day. What, today was I frugal, was I temperate, was I compassionate, and all of that. And he found out that he was doing very well. He was being all of these things. And he pointed out to one of his friends that he was achieving all of these goals. But his friend pointed out to him, but you're not being very humble. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to have this ability to laugh at ourselves from time to time. Yes, so I was invited to speak on this topic of uh, school leadership and students learning. You probably know that the, the big international research is that uh, teachers have um, a profound impact on uh, student learning, and that second to teachers' impact is school leaders' impact. But as a school leader, you have some complexities because you can't possibly interact with all of the students directly. So you have to become artistic at the art of um, leading indirectly, okay? being direct about indirect leadership. It's very interesting because you can't sit down with each one of your students and teach them, but you can help to shape a learning environment that the students are engaged with. So what I would like to do for the presentation today is to start off with some core problems of teaching, learning, and leading. I think that some of the core problems are cross-cultural in their dynamics, in the ways that we've developed schools and the way that they've evolved. So I want to lay out for you a little bit some of those core tensions, or problems, nested problems that we are always returning to again and again. And I want to relate these to four different ways of school leadership. And, and if you've heard these ways before, or if you've read the fourth way or the global fourth way, and you think, oh, gee, am I going to hear this again? <laughs> it's kind of like yesterday's news. What I'll ask you to do is to please remember that when we're talking about education, we're never just talking about structures. We're also always talking about cultures. And also, finally, we're talking about your identity. So, so when I present these ways, please don't think just, oh, these are different ways. They don't have anything to do with me. For me, it always comes down to, in the end, who are you and what do you stand for? And you cannot not stand for anything, okay? You cannot not leave a legacy. Like I have a friend of mine who, who said to uh, a friend, he said, I don't want to play that game. And his friend said, yes, but your piece is still on the board. And if you don't get good at moving your piece, there are many other people who will be happy to move it for you, okay? So leadership is about understanding who we are, looking within and looking without. And then I, I, I'm, I'm trying to explore networks now of educational change. I, I'm reading a lot of the documents from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And when I read their documents about educational change, it's almost always the case that nothing good is ever generated by the profession itself. And certainly nothing good is ever generated by student voice. It's essentially all things that governments do. And educators are fairly passive in this process. I think it's a dangerous, dangerous image to project of a profession that is really about passing on the accumulated cultural wisdom of humanity to a rising generation. So a lot of my thoughts are about activating ourselves in different ways. So I want to share with you three different network approaches to educational change based on the hypothesis 
I might be wrong, ladies and gentlemen. You always have to be open to that possibility, <laughs> frustrating as it is. But the hypothesis is that we have the collective resources in our profession to uplift learning collectively, humanistically, ecologically. We have that within ourselves, but we will have to develop new ways of thinking and working and collaborating together. So I want to share these three networks with you and then bring it all back home. What does that mean for, for us here in Norway? Everyone clear? Little roadmap there? Is I speaking too fast? You okay? Okay? We're okay. Good. Off we go. So the background for some of this, those of you who know me, is I work a lot with teachers. I did a co-authored book with a teacher called The Mindful Teacher. And then Andy and I did The Fourth Way, which has been translated into Norwegian. And this was a critique of contemporary trends in educational change. And this provides evidence that there are other ways of thinking about change. And now I'm editing this journal of educational change where we get a lot of good research, actually from Scandinavia. I was thinking of renaming it the Journal of Scandinavian Educational Change. It's great research in there, it's very empirical, but what I love about the um, articles that are submitted is the level of reflection that is going on. It's often related to people's values, their norms, so we don't get kind of a quick reactive response to research. There's a lot of reflection about what it means. Then I was part of an OECD team on improving lower secondary schools in Norway. And then this next book is called, well, it's supposed to be called Mindful. Hmm. There we go. Oh, oh popped up. Oh, well. Got to work on my Twitter. <laughs> it's called Mindful Educational Change, Achieving with Integrity. Let's see if the rest of this presentation works out. OK, let's get into these core problems, core problems. And for me, it's always related. Why is educational change so hard? You know, you can kind of tell, like my generation, a little bit Woodstock Nation, right? I thought it was all going to be Joni Mitchell. You know, it was all going to be peaceful and harmonious, like Ladies of the Canyon, all that good stuff. It turns out it's a lot harder than that. It seems fairly simple. You have these young people. They're enthusiastic, they're difficult, they're challenging, they're funny, right? They have these complicated personalities and we want them to learn at high levels. But in educational change, we can't always impact them directly, especially if you're a school leader, you have to go through teachers. And teachers have got a lot of interaction that's happening in the classroom. You know, we have to remember, if you're a classroom teacher, you've got a lot just managing all those kids, right? And then there's people coming in from the outside saying, well, now I want you to innovate, right? I want you to take big risks. Maybe you'll fail from time to time. As a classroom teacher, you remember how terrible it is when you've lost control of the class? It's the most embarrassing experience in the whole world, right? And then you swear, I will never, ever lose control of a class again. I will do anything not to feel that way. And we're asking these people in that situation to innovate. Okay, and to uplift performance. We're asking a lot of them. But then um, we're also asking this of them at a time when it's increasingly difficult to be a leader. So I would like to at thank my friend uh, JC Couture of the Alberta Teachers Association, who's up in the front here, part of the Canadian delegation, for recommending this book, The End of Leadership, by Barbara Kellerman. What she means there is, the old idea of the single superhero leader who's got all the strings in her or in his hands, forget it. Okay, the demands that are being placed upon leaders these days are enormous. I know you're getting in more curriculum, more standards, more assessment, more pressure. In Norway, this is a global trend. And if you think that you as a school leader can kind of control everything, and be the commando at the helm of the ship, you're probably in trouble. You will become a moral martyr. You will sacrifice yourself. You will experience divorce. You will become alcoholic. <laughs> and then you'll write a six volume, 3,600 
word long autobiography called Mein Kampf. Did I say that right? <laughs> and you'll read it and it will be disgusting. I've read the first two volumes. They're revolting. But why do I keep reading? I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. So don't become a moral martyr as a school leader. What's the alternative? How can you distribute the leadership around? How can you share it? But it has to be sharing genuine leadership. You can't just tell people what to do. You have to figure out what thirst do they have within them? What talent do they have within them? What strengths do they have that they have not yet brought into the school? And can you create some space so the school becomes a place of learning and a place of joy, not just for the children, but also for the adults and also for you? Okay? Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can meet this challenge. So we're trying to understand learning because ultimately that's your responsibility. And one dimension of this is pupil learning. So I'd also like to give a shout out to my friend and colleague, Gene Stiles here at the front, who I've learned so much from about how to be a principal and how to have fun. And this is how she does it. She moves through her school like a dynamo. She'll walk up to a, a shy student and she'll say, oh, what a pretty shawl. She compliments them so they're engaged. And then she'll say, how are you doing in that chemistry class? I know you were struggling. Is it getting better? Are you getting the help you need? Oh, okay, good. Goes on. Repeat 600 times that week, right? Constantly keeping the kids engaged. So you can do a lot of that, right? As you're just moving through the hallways of your school so that the kids know that you care. And then you can also support your teacher learning. Okay, so what are the possibilities for the teachers? to be thriving and growing so they feel, well, I'm not just going back to my school doing the same thing I did five years ago or 10 years ago. And you know, the older you get, the bigger a challenge it is because you've worked out good lesson plans. But you'll start boring yourself, okay, if you're not continually recreating it. And now the pressure is on, on teachers, and this will build on your remarks yesterday, Phil. I was working with a school outside of Boston, and uh, there was a teacher who was having the total meltdown. It was May. It had been a long school year. And she shared that there had been one parent who had sent to her 135 emails that year. 135 emails. And she was very worried about her son, who had a learning disability. But the irony was that they had worked out an individual educational plan, and the goal for the student this year was to learn to be an independent learner. Go figure, right? So then what we did is we kind of got all the staff together that worked with the student, met with the mother, kind of got things back on board. In other words, our teachers need a lot of support. How can they learn if they're always fielding those kinds of external pressures? Then the third part is staff learning. How do you help all of your staff to learn together? The most impressive act of principal leadership that I've seen in the last couple of years happened in a rural middle school in Toluca, Mexico. Mexico is a very dangerous place right now. It's pretty much been taken over by corrupt politicians and gangs, and the ruling party has not helped at all um, in, in Mexico. If you've been following the disappeared student teachers there and, and everything that's happened, um, it's outrageous. But I, I visited a rural middle school in Mexico last year, and the, the school was working a lot with tutorial relationships, helping students learn to tutor one another. Okay, and so when you go into the school, you see maybe 150 students all sitting at tables, and they're one-on-one -on -one facing each other, tutoring each other. And the spirit of tutorial relationships is so big in the school that the staff do that to each other to help to develop their curriculum knowledge. And even the principal got infected by this spirit of tutorial relationships, and he realized that he didn't know how to do some of the math problems that were in the curriculum that the students were asking them to do. And so he asked a student to tutor him on how he could solve this problem. And then he did a public demonstration of what he had learned to his staff. Humanizing learning. Nobody knows everything. Can you imagine that that might be possible to do one day in your building? That you could have that strength and that courage to say, I don't know everything. Here's something that I realize we ask our students to do that I don't know how to do. I'm going to ask my student a student to tutor me in that, and then I'm going to do a public demonstration. 
But you see, that wasn't just a one-off. That was part of the culture of that building. Okay, we're all learning. We're all tutoring each other. Then another dimension is organizational learning. So how are you helping your school to develop its whole organization? So I'm imagining that what that might mean in Norway would be you'd be working with your school owners from the counties, from the municipalities. You're studying challenges of change. You're deliberating together. You're bringing parents, community members into the organization. This is what we do in, in democratic societies. And then there's fifth, learning networks. The Utanungsvorbundet is a learning network, okay? If it's not just doing traditional union functions. This is a learning network right now. If you all are collaborating with Alberta and with Ontario, then you're a learning network. It's lateral learning across the profession, which should help you to be learning about your leadership. And if you're not learning about your leadership, then something's wrong. Right? Because there's always so much to learn about these demanding jobs that require so much of us. Now, in my remarks this morning, I'm going to be focusing on the learning networks and the leadership learning, partly because I feel that this is where the biggest payback is right now. You can't spend all of your effort on pupil learning. Even teacher learning, you can't spend all of your time doing that, developing the whole staff, the organizational learning. But what you can do now, and what is very important, is that we start creating a unified profession that your colleagues are proud of, that you stand behind, that you articulate a vision, not just for your school, not just for your region, but perhaps even for your country and perhaps even for the world. Envisioning a world where we move beyond poverty, beyond climate change, where every child has a right to an education. So these are a few reflections about how we organize learning, but it turns out it's very difficult to organize learning. I'm sorry, that was too fast. I'm always referring to this book, School Teacher by Dan Lordy. I think it's maybe one of the three most important books on education from the last century. Okay? He wanted to really understand the internal life of the teacher, the mental life of the teacher. School Teacher by Dan Lordy. It came out in 1976. And Lordy said that teachers are trapped often in a kind of a Bermuda Triangle of educational change. That's my expression, not his. I kind of try and throw in a little drama. <laughs> he said teachers get trapped in short-term thinking. You're just managing so much with all those kids that if you're not careful, you're just going to be managing short-term. You won't be Looking back, and you won't really be projecting forward. You're just managing everything on a daily basis to get through. And then, as a coping strategy, you learn to shut the door just to manage with the kids who are in front of you. You don't want too many people coming in. Just trust me. Close the door. And then, once you've kind of figured out what works, you stick with it, right? Because you don't like chaos. You don't like turbulence. But what Lordy said is if you're not careful, these three dynamics will reinforce each other and you will be in a learning impoverished environment. Okay? You will not have opportunities for thinking deeply about your profession. You will be closed in to an insular world. Okay? You will be imprisoned in privatism and you will stop experimenting. So you become predictable and boring. Right? And the, the hardest thing, when, I don't know if you ever do this, it's something worth doing, is to just spend a day following a student around, probably in another school. And a lot of what kids do in school is a lot of sitting, it's just sitting and getting. Right? So we have to try and figure out how can we transform our schools so that our students are active and so that we move into a different kind of environment, a learning-enriched school where we're not just focused on the past, nor are we always just looking at the future, nor are we fixated on the present, but we're integrating time. So you have opportunities to go back and think about what was teaching like when you entered it? Phil gave us a lot of information about how it's changing. How can we be part of positive transformations? And how, instead of being an individualism or privatism, can we enjoy collegiality? And it can be critical collegiality. People can say, well, I don't think you did that part right, or you left these kids behind, or, why do you choose that book? Right, so we kind of start stirring everything up and we have to pay attention to the emotions of change. Right, so you, every time you say something critical, you say two nice things. 
And if somebody's super sensitive and you know that, you say six nice things. But eventually you do get around to saying something critical because nobody's perfect. Right? And then instead of conservatism, it's developmentalism. It's not liberalism or radicalism as an alternative. It's the idea you get to learn across the whole lifespan. You get to keep on learning. Okay? And by the way, principal in English, it originally meant principal teacher. Then it, the adjective became a noun, right? The principal teacher. So if you think of yourself as a principal in that English sense, you are the principal teacher of all of the teachers in the building. So that's a little bit about our core problems. Now, how can this relate to some different ways of change? From what I hear from people in Norway, there's still a fair amount of a first way of change where teachers have a lot of individualism. It's Robin Williams in the Dead Poets Society, <laughs> right? Standing up on the chair, captain, my captain, tearing out the first page of the book. It's magnificent, right? It's exciting, it's inspirational. But right next to Robin Williams in that movie may be a teacher who is dead boring, right? Who has never done anything new, who just teaches from one page to the next in the book in a dull monotone that will never end. It's interminable. It goes on for 180 days. And in this first way of change, there was no strategy for getting at that. Okay, because the teacher or the principal was sovereign. Professionalism meant individualism. Now, in Norway, I don't think, you're doing a little bit of this now, standards. Okay, you're getting clearer about standards and curriculum, but you still haven't kind of thrown in markets a whole lot. Sweden did that. How well did that work out? Okay, so it may be that by you waiting and observing, you can avoid a second way of change, but this is shaking up education around the world. Educators feel a lot of competitive pressure now okay, to get students in and get results up. And then increasingly what we're seeing is data-driven leadership. Okay? So you come into a school and you don't really have deep reflections about individual learners. You just see these wall charts right, that track all the test score results. And that's what educational leadership has become today. And that's what Andy Hargreaves and I have studied a lot and observed. And then we just kind of asked ourselves, well, could there be something beyond that? Maybe we just end up in a Kafka-esque novel of educational change, right, where the soulless bureaucracy takes over and micromanages your every action until you die. <laughs> Maybe that's where we're ending up, but not without a fight, right? You still, you still have some fight. And you know, what I'm finding out with my students is I don't even have to win. If they just see we're putting up a good fight, they find it inspirational, okay? And so the fourth way, well, that might be, okay, yeah, we still have, we want to have some individualism, some standards are good, sure, we'll look at evidence, but ultimately we want to be able to have, make good decisions based on our values, our vision of the future, our care for our students, our love of our societies and this beautiful planet. So let's go into each of these a little bit more, and then we'll get into those networks. This is Prezi, by the way, if you like this, this presentation format. So the first way, this is what I, I observe a lot in Norway. Teachers have got a lot of academic freedom. The curriculum's still pretty broad, pretty engaging. I know it's moving towards literacy and math, science, of course, for PISA, but the curriculum's still fairly broad. Is this true that when the snow is here, the kids get to take off one day a week to go skiing? Okay, that's wonderful. Athletic, outdoor nation, teaching them the love of nature. A lot of passive trust towards schools, although the test score results and comparisons are eroding that. Still a fairly strong emphasis on responsibility, innovation within the individual schools. Professionals are equal, right? The math teacher is just as good as the drama teachers, the physical education, okay? And then if you want to get change moving, you seek to develop the internal motivation. Is that right? Is this pretty much where Norway is? Okay. If we had time, it'd be kind of interesting point of discussion. I have friends who say, oh, Norway, they're so naive. They don't realize what's coming. We have to warn them. Dennis, warn them. Tell them before it's too late. 
second way of change, the government starts saying, well, we recommend some standards. Here's some standards that you could, you could teach. And, and, and we're just going to start piloting you know, some mandatory tests here and there. Just going to start just a little bit, nothing real ex serious. And then in the US, many jurisdictions will say, well, we'll start experimenting with school governance. They did this in Sweden. Okay? So we'll kind of start contracting out. The schools get public resources, but they're pri privately managed. Okay? So we'll start doing those kinds of things because that's what um, some former prime ministers in England found popular. England does not do very well on assessments. But we will start some professional learning communities. We'll get educators meeting together. We'll get the professional associations involved in this. They'll help to set some of the standards. They'll be in some of the meetings with ministries. Uh, we will start, by the way, publicly ranking though the schools and the systems, and we'll do this in the name of transparency. Everybody should have this information. And we'll start talking about accountability a lot. We all have to be accountable. Uh, now, is this where Norway is moving? Yes. Oh dear, my beloved Norway. Turn back. Turn back. And then, we'll see if you're here. This is interesting. Data-driven leadership. Now we just start getting into standardization. And you know, the dangerous place that you get to, like in the US, a lot of young teachers like this because it's easier. Just tell me what to teach, I'll do it. I'll collect my salary, I'll go home. It's great. Okay, so we'll just standardize everything and then I'll implement. I don't have to think about it. Okay, and then we'll focus on literacy and mathematics. Okay, those are the gateway subjects. Science, kids aren't really interested in the natural world. That's not a gateway. Music, kids hate music. They never want to learn how to play a musical instrument. I'm being ironic. Okay. So let's just focus on literacy and math, right? And then we'll say what the goals are, and that's what the educator should hit. Okay? So, you know, John Dewey used to kind of write that in education, you're always teaching something explicitly and something implicitly. You always have an explicit goal, but you can't help but teach yourself. You're always teaching yourself along the way. That kind of stuff doesn't matter anymore. We just got the measurable results we want. We're going to test, test, test. Feels like some governments, they never saw a test they didn't love, right? And so you, you put a lot of emphasis on assessment. You get the bureaucracy kind of monitoring everything. So in English now, um, there is a verb, a clipboard. You know, it's a little kind of clip thing you can write paper on. But the teachers will say, did you get clipboarded this morning? That means somebody came through, some complete stranger, not the principal, somebody from the ministry of the district, they came through and went through a checklist. So there's a lot of that, and it's just strange people who show up and then disappear. So no, no discussion before being clipboarded, no discussion afterwards. And then because you can't really trust the leaders, well, you give them a bonus if they get their test score results up. And if they don't get the test score results up, whenever you have a, a, a big meeting, you'll put the ones with bad test score results in the back of the room back there. And the ones with the good test score results will sit up in the front, and they'll get extra muffins with a cream puff on top. <laughs> and you could get the award from the American Association of Superintendents, as Beverly Hall did in Atlanta, for this very test-driven approach. But guess what? Now she's in jail facing criminal charges for corruption. About 130 educators were manipulating the test score results. Question, is that the problem of Beverly Hall or is that the problem of the system? Think about it, think about it, okay? And then we're gonna say, you can't really trust democracy. People, they're not really adults. Let's get markets in there to shake everything up. Again, the Swedish model, okay? So if you love what they did in Sweden, okay? Then you'll love the third way, data-driven leadership. Now, what could be beyond this? And ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying. Please, we've all got to try together. There's got to be something beyond it, something beyond Kafka's castle. So maybe it's mindful leadership. Maybe we start seeing the people that are the closest to the learners are the ones who should be driving change. Just like in the medical profession, nobody says we should be telling the doctors what to do. In law, we don't get outsiders telling people what the lawyers should do, right? So the people who are closest to the action should be empowered to drive change forward. And we embrace equity, right? 
Every human being has equal value. We don't say you're poor, you have a funny accent, you're an immigrant. We embrace equity as a principle and we say that education is a collective responsibility. We all are responsible for this rising generation. We don't say, oh, not my kids, not my issue. Okay? We own it collectively and we have integrity. Okay? So if somebody in the government is saying, oh, can't you figure out a way to get those test score results up? Give the kids banana and waters before the test and if that doesn't work to hydrate the brain, give them some Coke and some candy so they're really all wound up. We say, no, that's not our role. Okay? We're guardians of the integrity of the profession and we don't give up on democracy. Good heavens, everybody wants to be Shanghai now, right? Neoliberals have married communists. It's an interesting world, right? So, well, freedom of speech, it's kind of a hassle. Why don't we just do as we're told? Okay. <laughs> Student voice. You know, think of where we would be in the United States and we have a lot of dangerous unrest in the United States right now because we haven't paid much attention in education to how do we live together. What if we had been focusing on that for the past 25 years? What if we had been encouraging our students to exercise student voice through their school system to be responsible citizens, planetary citizens? We can't do that with just test-based accountability. And, and then can we learn from each other learn from each other, not borrow from each other, not imitate each other in our different contexts. And then finally, Andy and I didn't write about this, but I'm now increasingly obsessed about it. Can we be good stewards of the environment? Okay. Teddy Roosevelt was a, a great US president, and he said, whenever we're voting, we, we have to realize we're not just voting for ourselves, we're voting for those future generations that don't have a vote right now. So, can we be good stewards? These are, for me, some of the things we should be thinking about in educational change. Now, we have this thing called PISA, right? And Andy and I tried to look at some different networks. We saw, oh, Finland's doing well, Singapore, Alberta, Ontario, UK, and the United States not so well. What can we learn from what's going on in Finland, Singapore, Alberta, and Ontario? And of course, I told you about Mexico and how that inspired me. I've never been in a school where I didn't learn something really important. And I've been in impoverished schools in dangerous communities, and often there are diamonds in the rough in there. Right? So we can learn from everyone. You don't have to be a so-called high achiever. But Andy and I looked at some of these PISA results. That was math, this is reading. It's, it's all pretty much the same. Finland, Singapore, Alberta, and Ontario doing quite well. The US and the United Kingdom struggling behind there. But we tried to say, could we look at some networks that are going on in these countries and see what they might be doing together? And we found this concept of professional capital, which we developed in the global fourth way. It has five components. And if I was a principal, I would, this is where I'd write things down. I used to always say to people, oh, don't write it down, it's in the PowerPoint slide. But then I read the research that said that actually when you write things down, it helps with memory retention. And by the way, writing things down is better than typing them. Because you can type really fast, but you can't write that fast. And when you write, you have to think about what you're writing. Interesting. So the first part of the professional capital of educators is the human capital, smart individuals. Are you bringing the smartest people into the profession? If you're not, that's a policy question. It's a policy question for the government. And I don't know how you do it in Norway or Alberta when you got all this oil, right? And people can just go off and make two or three times as much as the educators. But if you can be creative about it, I'll bet you can. The second part of professional capital is the social capital, the economic value that lies in relationships between people. Okay? This became popular in the US. We used to have grandparents or parents sitting on front porch at the end of the day and they'd watch all the kids playing outside. And then TV came and now computers, and nobody sits outside and watch the kids anymore. So the parents take the kids and put them in after school programs didn't realize there was economic value in people sitting on the front porch. And in schools also, one of the things that you can be doing as a principal is help to develop the social capital of the building. Oh, you're teaching this unit in grade four. Did you know that Sally's doing something with this in grade five? You guys could talk together and see if you could do something to your students have a curriculum that connects across the years. Then the third part here is the moral capital. 
Moral capital is what I saw on Sunday night last week in Oslo. A colleague here, Irvin, told me about this. There were a couple of students in Oslo who said, we're concerned about mobbing, bullying in our schools. We want to have an action in the old city. And so there's the Utanumsforbund that shows up with a big banner and hundreds of people marching through the old city with torches, right? That's moral capital. You're saying we care about our young people. We don't want them to be injured. We don't want them to be psychologically damaged. That's a very important part of the education profession. And our professional associations can really help to develop that and also symbolic capital. The enemy of the teaching profession was George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw wrote a play called Man and Superman. He liked Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, the whole Superman thing. And one of the characters in that play says, those who can do, those who can't teach, which is a horrible curse. You know, if you say that to somebody in Asia, they can't understand it because, of course, teaching is so highly venerated there. So one of the challenges that we have as a profession is to try and make sure that people understand the nature of our expertise. That is symbolic capital. And then finally, fifth is decisional capital. We have to think. We have to think, okay? So if nothing else comes out of this presentation today, and you're thinking six weeks from now about what Dennis Shirley said, and the only thing you remember is, oh yeah, Dennis Shirley, he's that guy who said we have to think. I'd be happy with that, <laughs> okay? This is not cut and paste. Right? This is about developing our thinking together. Now then, let's get on to these networks. So raising achievement, transforming learning in England. Andy and I studied this, and this was a while ago, but I still care enormously about what we learned from this network. So what the English did is they created this network, and if you look, R-A-T-L, rattle, as in shake, rattle, and roll. Okay? They put together schools that had poor achievement results. And they developed a strategy of schools learning from schools. They even called it professionalizing learning, schools learning from schools. How can we get really professional at how we learn from each other? So don't just come by and drop by, but actually figure out, are there some common themes? Are there some common areas where we're struggling? So they networked these schools together and they were struggling schools. So can you imagine being approached we see you're not doing really well. Would you like to join our network? <laughs> it was invitational, okay, nobody had to join, and if you joined, you got just a little bit of money, 9,000 pounds, but there were no strings attached. You could go to your staff and you could say, what do you want to spend this money on? What do you care about? Right, so there was some freedom. They did get experts in to look at the data. They respected evidence. And then they, they found schools that could mentor the struggling schools. And they had head teachers who were consultants who roved around to help to identify problems in this school learning from school network. A lot of data-driven decision-making, a lot of focus on evidence in this network. And then they had an online web portal for, where principals could post questions to one another and respond, okay? And this was great. They had short, medium, long-term strategies. So a short-term strategy was within a single year, Okay, within a single year, let's really focus on math, let's focus on literacy, we've got to get those results up. Okay, let's throw some things into the works. But medium term might be long term, like how could we do more creative things? How could we be more playful? How could we help our kids to feel like this is their school? How could we do some things with the arts or environmental education? So they worked on all of this together and they got these great results. Two thirds of the schools increased their achievement results at double the national average in two years. And by the way, secondary school reform is a graveyard of educational change. Usually we can get the results up pretty quickly in the primary schools. Secondary schools, complicated. The teachers are individualists, the departments are balkanized. It's a struggle, okay? But they found a way to do this, okay? But at a certain cost, Andy and I found. Okay, so Dan Lordy, he wrote about presentism. Remember that short-term thing? He said it was kind of endemic. It's kind of all around us. Well, in the Rattle Network, 
people started off by just adjusting their presentism a little bit. So let's adjust it so we can get the test scores up. And then their test scores went up and then they became addicted to it. Let's just look at the data. We get those results up and the policymakers are happy. Parents come in, the press come by, everybody loves us. But we're kind of losing the broader purposes of education. So this is, Andy and I did an article in Teachers College Record, The Persistence of Presentism, which is the best thing we ever wrote, I think. The, the books are kind of great, they're all chatty and friendly, but this is just a short piece and it's tough. We get great quotes from the principals that say, we love this network, we got so many ideas from it that were gimmicky and great. They're quick little gimmicks that you could throw into the system to get the results up. Okay? Now to give credit to this network, after we did this research and we challenged them, they went back and said, okay, let's go back and do the transforming learning part. But then, Prime Minister changed, it wasn't Tony Blair anymore, it was Gordon Brown, and the way that democracies sometimes get involved in schools, every new Prime Minister wants to have a new program, so he cut the whole funding. Success does not always guarantee sustainability. The second one is, um, this is an exquisitely beautiful part of the world. I sometimes think that the worst decision that I ever make in my life is when I get on a plane to leave Alberta. Okay? Absolutely beautiful. And um, what's significant about Alberta is that the government wanted to put together a school-based incentive plan to give teachers and schools rewards when they got the results up, and the Alberta Teachers Association said, no, we are not going to do that. We have a different way of thinking about how we're going to improve our achievement. So they created this Alberta Initiative for School Improvement, and they started networking schools. It was invitational to get innovation going into the system. And to a certain extent, ladies and gentlemen, you do have to decide, are we about improvement? Or do we have some space in our system for innovation, for doing new things, for taking some risks, for allowing our young people to try something different? Okay? And if you're saying that every time that we innovate, we must get improvement results, then you're probably not innovating. And you shouldn't even use the word. You just say, we're not innovating. We think the best way to meet the challenges of the future is not to innovate. Okay, never mind. I'm getting worked up. I'm jet lagged and I've had two cups of coffee. What are you gonna do? You can't contain me. I got the microphone. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm not always like this, but, but I often am. <laughs> So you network these schools together, you have people, you say, put together a proposal on anything. Environmental education, aboriginal education, technology, what are you guys interested in? Put it together, okay? And then um, set aside a big chunk of the provincial education budget, like 80 million a year to support this network so that we can do research on the network, so people can visit each other's schools, so they can challenge each other, so we can grow. And then we're going to not just learn schools from schools, but districts from districts. Okay? Networks from networks across the whole province. And we'll look at the numbers, but we'll also look at cultural change. Okay? The numbers don't tell us everything. And we'll get the teachers observing each other. Okay? And one of my favorite days, I was visiting one of the schools, and a kindergarten teacher was showing me around. It was a kindergarten through grade 8 school. And, I said, and we were up in the middle school part of the building. I said, well, I guess you never come over here. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, why would you come over here to you know, the, the middle school? And she said, well, how am I going to know what to prepare my students for if I don't come over here and see what they're doing later on? That was a networked school. That was a learning school. That was a school that had gone from privatism to collegiality. Okay, so, so this huge power for learning from each other and easy as in rattle, they used technology to network the members together. But still not everything's perfect. Now, if you're in a school with leaders who are really into learning, then you could take that AZ network and you could fly through the roof, right? Because the administration is supporting it at the upper levels. But if you had school owners who were really focused, maybe there were really good values. Let's do service to the community. Let's help people. But they didn't connect it to learning no learning gains for the kids. Maybe they're working on a recycling project. Maybe they're working in a, a home for old people. Maybe they're volunteering with this, doing with that. But you forgot to anchor it in the learning. 
And then worst of all, if you focus on management, then the teachers and the students all feel this isn't even our project. And somebody just created something else for me to do. And it's not schools learning from schools, teachers learning from teachers, principals learning from, pre from principals. It's another thing that came down from the government and how on earth can we get out of this meeting as quickly as possible? So, so this is a problem with how that developed. And um, as all, all good things come to an end, right? You know that Bruce Springsteen song, Atlantic City? Everything dies, baby, that's a fact. I'm not going to sing it to you. I am going to spare you that. But everything that dies someday comes back. Everything that dies someday comes back. And so these networks, they keep coming back, right? It's like mushrooms, right? You know, you kind of gather them all over here and you chop them all off, but then they spread. Because educators want to get better. We want to get better, even when you cut off the funding. Okay? Even when government shifts in another direction, it's very hard to stop people from wanting to do the best job they can for their students. Very hard to stop that. Especially once, once it's been encouraged, it develops its own momentum. Now California, just like Alberta, the government said, well, we don't really like or trust you educators that much right now. So in Alberta, they said, we want to create an incentive program. And in California, we had Schwarzenegger, Thanks a lot, Europe. <laughs> you know, like, we could be importing the Nordic model of the welfare state, and instead we end up with the Terminator. <laughs> this is not my, my dream of cross-cultural exchange. What's going on here? And the Terminator gets in there and he says, we've got to balance the budget. We're going to take $2.3 billion out of the education budget. And the California Teachers Association says, forget it. You're violating the state constitution. Requires a certain amount of funding to go to education. We are going to sue you, and we are going to win. And when we win, we're going to take that $2.3 billion, and we're going to create a network to support each other and to learn from each other in our str struggling schools. OK? That means that when you're organizing for the public good in a place like California, and you create a network that's called CUA, Quality Education Investment Act, it's not enough to have professional capital. You must have political capital. You must have some spine. Okay? The governments are our friends. We're, we're working in multicultural, multilingual democracies, but every now and then they have to be challenged. Okay? So you must have professional and political capital, and you must have some courage. You had a 21 day strike here, I understand. That's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. I wish that our teachers would go on a strike for 21 days. I wish our whole society would, but never mind. <laughs> okay? And then what they said is, we want to have innovation with improvement in this network, and we're not going to do what often happens, which is the money goes to the districts, and then the superintendents control it. The money has to go straight to these 500 schools. Okay? It's going to go straight into the principals and the school councils. And we're going to get people intensively interacting with each other, asking questions, and learning about our learning. So people started reading books and arguing about books. You guys had any good professional arguments in your building lately? I strongly encourage it. We, in the Mindful Teacher seminars, we read this book called So Much Reform, So Little Change. And half the teachers hated the book. They said, this is an awful book. It describes how bad our schools are. Now nobody's going to want to work in our schools. And the other half of the teachers loved the book. They said, this is a fabulous book. It describes how awful our schools are. And now we can get young, idealistic people to come in and make them better. It's really interesting. But it's, it's important to have arguments in our buildings. And then they got great achievement gains in these QAA schools. Okay? They, they went from way, way below the state average to above the state average in a five-year time period. So networks can help us to improve achievement. What does this mean for Norway? Well, nobody can say you're not trying in Norway. Okay, nobody can say that you're not innovating. The conservatives got the ideas, okay? Socialists, liberals, everybody's got ideas to develop schools. And you probably have all of your own opinions about what's being done. But it certainly seems that you're moving beyond that first way of change. I'm not, you know, if we had more time, this is like too short. What's really fun is when you have three days and you can really go deep.
into these things. But you, you have a program for school development, knowledge promotion as a theme for the schools and developing schools for head teachers. These are important initiatives if they're done in the right way. I don't know that they're being done in the right way, but they could be very important initiatives. Transition project between lower and upper secondary, very important. Okay, I, I looked at the results. The students who are least engaged with schools in Norway are, are the lower secondary students. They're pretty engaged in primary, pretty engaged in upper secondary, lower secondary. They start disengaging. Trying to focus on better assessment practices, certainly very important if you can be looking at formative assessments. Trying to look at the quality of your education and now something new, a national graduate school in teacher education. Elaine Muntz, are you in the room? Okay, Elaine is the Dean of Teacher Education at the University of Schaubinger. She's working in this new national graduate school in teacher education, helping to prepare teachers who do inquiry and reflection. Well, I'm just going to manage to end this in time. I wasn't sure. So, what does this mean? We've described now a little bit some of the core challenges of teaching, learning, and leading. We've looked at four different ways of change. We've looked at three different change networks. I'm hoping as you go along that you're kind of thinking, oh, there is some energy out there in the profession. There are people who are trying different things. I wonder if I could imagine joining a network. Could we do something like they did in Alberta or something like they did in California? Great people, great colleagues. And those of you that, I think everybody in the room knows that Norway and Canada are now embarking on an important new um, international partnership. I hope what we can do for the way ahead for educational changes, partly to go back to this book by John Dewey, Democracy and Education. It's 98 years old, so in another two years it will be its centennial. So you can't feel too badly about those PISA results in Norway, right, when you're number one on the Human Development Index for child well-being, uh, quality of life, health care, all of those different things. Yeah, not bad. That's, that seems very impressive. So one of the things I'm hoping we can do for the future is we're always asking about the relationship between the school and the society. What's the relationship? Are we making optimal use of that relationship, that dynamic? Dewey was about putting those together. Are we seeing the relationship between the child and the curriculum as a continuum? so that the children get a chance sometimes to ask their own questions that then become part of the curriculum. That's key for student voice. If the curriculum is always imposed, kids have a hard time loving learning, loving school. I hope we don't give up on this. Now internationally there's all these books with names like Surpassing Shanghai, Learning from the Asian Model. I hope we don't decide, oh, democracy, that's a 19th century idea. <laughs> Human rights. It doesn't really matter that much. Let's see if we can find ways to preserve and strengthen democracies and help to be disciplined in how we study and to combine that with our students' interests so that schools become not just places of labor, but also places of leisure. You know, it's really interesting. Students will play these video games for hours on end, and it's kind of like adults with crossword puzzles. The point isn't necessarily winning. It's an engaging activity. Can we do things in our schools so that our students are enjoying the pleasure of mathematics just for trying to solve problems? And, you know, I should be wrapping things up, but there's this wonderful book, it's on Fermat's theorem. Do we have some mathematicians in the room who know about Fermat's theorem? It was, there was this French mathematician who had this theorem that he jotted down some notes in the margin of a, of a book back in the 17th century, and it, it took up until, I think it was solved maybe 15 years ago. And uh, I love this story. I read a book about Fermat's theorem. There, there was a German mathematician who decided he was a lot like uh, Knuschgott, you know? Life is a veil of tears. We suffer. We endure. <laughs> but this guy decided he couldn't handle it anymore. He was going to commit suicide, right? But because he was very Germanic and disciplined, he didn't want to just commit suicide at any time. He wanted to commit it at midnight, right? And it was around 3 in the afternoon. So he said, what am I going to do to pass the time? And he said, well, I guess I'll work on trying to solve Fermat's theorem here. So he's working on it, and he's working on it, and he's getting into it, and he's working on it. And all of a sudden, he hears the rooster crow. The rooster crow. And he realizes, I still have some passion for something in this life. There's still something that 
fully absorbs my attention. And he went on to have a very long and distinguished career. Right? So we mustn't think that mathematics just has to be drudgery. It can be joy, right? as, as could any subject be. Now, this is a masterpiece. This is a masterpiece. And it is the antidote to Pisa. Learning the Treasure Within, a UNESCO report that said for the future of humanity, there are four broad areas that we have to address. First, learning to know. We do have to know things. And then also learning to make. That's often vocational education. We have to be good with our hands, good at making things. But they also said there's two other dimensions. One is learning to be. Learning to be. And in North America, this is a place where we can learn so much from our indigenous elders. How can you be in harmony with the planet? Be in harmony with one another. Not always be fixing things. Sometimes just be at peace in this world. And then what UNESCO said is going to be most important is learning to be together. Learning to be together. Look at all the conflict that's happening around the world. Look at the, the unrest that's been occurring in the United States okay, in the last week. And you realize this learning to be together is so important. And probably data-driven decision-making is not going to teach us how to learn to be together. We're going to need a different set of skills. We're going to need to know how to listen to each other. Almost like kindergartners are good at listening to each other. My wife loves to tell this story. She's a kindergarten teacher. And she was having, they were having circle time with the kids. They were talking about issues in the class that they were trying to resolve together. And one student says, well, I think that we should try and solve this issue this way. And the next one says, we should try and solve it that way. And the third one says, we should try and solve it that way. They're passing around a talking stick. And he gets to the fourth student. And he gets the stick. And he says, my mommy loves me so much. <laughs> and then passes the stick on. And nobody laughs. Because they're kindergartners. They're all together. Isn't that wonderful? OK, so. Six big takeaways. Grow your professional networks if you can. Please don't go back to privatism as a school leader. Don't model that for your colleagues. And when you grow your network, beware of sleeping members. Because remember I said in that rattle network that two-thirds of the schools posted gains at twice the national average. So Andy and I wanted to find out what about the schools that didn't have any gains or had declines. And we called up those schools and interviewed them every single one was a sleeping member. They said basically, we have everything we need in our school. No, no, we're not going out and learning. No, we're really happy with what we're doing. Guess what? Your results are going down. Now is a good time to learn. Okay? We do have to look at evidence, okay? but we don't have to be enslaved to it. And you do have to be courageous every now and then. What if the Alberta Teachers Association hadn't taken on their government? What if the California Teachers Association hadn't done that? You have to be vigilant. And as you kind of go about this change, please think long term. Long term, not just the next couple of years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe a generation or two ahead, and be mindful. Okay, be mindful, and that always means being open-minded. Okay, it means listening to dissidents. A great Albertan educator, Dean Lindquist, as a superintendent, he said something which I will always remember. He said, we have to protect the dissidents. We have to protect the people that think differently. OK, why do we have to do that? Because these are great kids. These are great kids. You can learn so much from them. They can just give you so much joy, so much humor, so much love, so much warmth. They can challenge you. They can frustrate you. But you're alive with them together. And it's part of the human condition to want to do our very best. And if we can get the teachers and the kids excited together so that when Monday comes around, everybody's excited to go back to the school, excited to learn new things, to make new friendships, then, because our time on this earth is limited, when we're looking back in our old age, we can say, well, I made a bunch of mistakes, but I always tried my very best, and I never sold my kids short, and I always did what was best for them. I believe that we can do this together. I would like to thank you for your dedication to our profession. Tusen Tak.